Alright, here we go. Let's see. Test, test, testing. Alright, good. Alright, um, so, Brother Renoko, what can you tell us about your work? Um, you know, I, as we understand, you're a world traveler, Pan African scholar. Uh, could you tell uh, happily now to the audience a little bit about what you do in the community and 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 what you see your role as uh, as it pertains to African history? I'm a historian, and mostly what I see my role as is um, a facilitator to increase the level of African consciousness in our community. I would argue that it's not enough to know you must be. It's not enough to just have the information. You've got to do something with it. And so my job is to come and get the information, disseminate that information, and inspire our people to do things that would redeem our African ancestors, improve the status of the African community, and move us towards African liberation. Uh, how many different countries have you traveled to, and what would you consider your most interesting trip? I've been to more than 90 countries, uh, a couple of colonies, and a couple of overseas territories. Officially, the total is 94 countries. In each region has its own particulars. In Europe, France has a fascinating African presence. In the Pacific, New Guinea. In the North Pacific, uh, maybe a place like Chuuk. In Africa, Uganda and Malawi, Ghana. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the part of the world. South America, I'm particularly interested in the African presence in the Andes. Mm -hmm. okay. Considering, you know, today we got, you know, the war on terror and all this talk about Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, you know, a lot of uh, issues concerning the quote-unquote Middle East. Uh, what can you tell us about the African presence in that, in that region? Well, there's Africans in every country in the world that I'm aware of or certainly the vast majority of them, when we look at on TV, we don't see them. Black people in Iraq, in Iran, in Israel, in Palestine, Africans in all of these parts of the world. And these are the people I think of as the invisible people. Africans who exist, but whose existence is scarcely acknowledged by the rest of the world, including other Africans. We know very little about black people in that part of the world. And I think that's one of the reasons that my presentations are interesting and appealing to a lot of people. It's because it's opening up doors in the African community of which most of us are not aware of. Uh, what about the uh, African origins of different world civilizations, specifically like, you know, uh, nations like India, Greece, China, Britain? We, we, these are major continents where we really don't hear about the African origins. What can you tell us about that? Well, I'm reluctant these days to say African origins, but I am very comfortable with dealing with an African presence. And certainly in all of these classical civilizations, you can find an African component. If you look at Greece, for example, you can see African people in Greek mythology. Andromeda, Memnon, um, you know, various personalities, Medea mm -hmm. in Greek mythology. If you look at um, the African, you can look at, at the African presence in Imperial Rome. Mm -hmm. Africans in the Indus Valley, Africans in the Tigris Euphrates, Africans in the Mekong River Valley, Africans among the Olmec civilization in the Americas. Mm -hmm. And these things are very important to point out because most of us have the idea that our history began with enslavement. Mm -hmm. And as long as we continue to identify our history with enslavement, then I don't think we, I mean, we're crippled from the beginning. So I really want to look at what Africans did before Columbus, before enslavement, even before Christ. Uh, well, I want to move on and talk about academia and scholarship because uh, a lot of people, um, we, 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 we get into the modes of, 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 continue, of looking at, you know, scholars, intellectuals uh, versus laymen, and I want to kind of uh, blurry that water up and talk about the movement from the perspective of academia, scholarship, intellectualism. Um, my first question in that vein is, what are your thoughts on being a scholar slash uh, warrior in the context of being an African historian in uh, Western ac academia or in, uh, in academia period? Well, the scholar that really influenced me the most at an early stage is Chancellor Williams. And I think Chance Williams personified that. He was um, he went to um, Oxford University for a while. Mm -hmm. He studied at a number of American universities, you know, got his doctorate degree. But I think Chancellor Williams was a man of the people. Mm -hmm. And I think that he believed that history had to be 
that history wasn't dead, that we had to use history to motivate the people. And I think that's one of the failures with modern academia. I think most academicians are used to talking to other academicians. Mm -hmm. And they live in this small, what we call, ivory tower. Mm -hmm. I think the true African scholar today has to go beyond that. And I think he has to reach the masses, or she has to reach the masses. And the failure to do that, I think, is one of the big stumbling blocks that we have in our community. But there are some people who have gone beyond it. William Leo Hansberry, I think Leonard Jeffries. Jay Rogers, but a lot of those people too have been looked down upon and condemned by other academicians. So you have to be, in terms of the warrior mentality, you have to be very strong, you have to believe in yourself, and you have to have confidence in yourself. And some people regard that as conceit or ego or arrogance. But you can't be, um, um, what is the word I want to use? Um, you can't be a shrinking violin in this field. You have to have strength. And you have to know what it's about. You have to be willing to take risk. And you have to be always keep in mind that what it's all about, and that is lifting up the people. Uh, during the 60s and 70s, there were huge struggles to incorporate black or African studies into colleges and universities. Have these struggles and or have those struggles improved the conditions of African people uh, to your, to, uh, on your, upon your observations? Yeah, I think they've improved the conditions of African people. But I think that we've kind of relapsed today. Mm. And so now you have people saying that there's no no further need for Black History Month mm. to talk about black history, that we just have to talk about world history. Mm. To me, that's nonsense. Right. And not only do we have a need to do that, but I think that black scholars themselves um, have to do it. Right. I think that nobody can tell the story of African people effectively but African people. Mm. Um. What similarities, well, I want to get into some stuff about global peace and, you know, just uh, touch on that because that's your area. Uh, what similarities do you see around the globe and how Africans and indigenous people resist uh, white and Arab supremacy and seek to retain their identity? That struggle has been going on for a long time. Again, if we go back to Chancellor Williams, he would argue in Destruction of Black Civilization that Arabs have been as as remorseless as uh, that Arabs have been consistently as much the enemy of African people as Europeans have been and I think that my recent trip to southern Sudan um, exemplified that the sisters and brothers there believe that they have been the front line against the Arab expansion into actually Central Africa mm. So it's an ongoing struggle, and I think that that struggle has to be recognized. You have to think about these sisters and brothers in the Philippines, mm. in the Andaman Islands, in Central Africa, and Australia. And I can't credit them enough because, mm. against overwhelming odds, they've somehow managed to survive. Mm. And their very survival is, I think, a testimony to the resilience and the tenacity mm. of African people and indigenous people. Gotcha. All right. Um, how important is it for Africans to realize the global manifestations of being African and also to travel or, or, or and actually see it and experience it? Well, I think African Americans have more money than any other Africans and most of the Africans. And, you know, I pointed out earlier in my lecture that I think that we've had a tendency to romanticize Africa, mm -hmm. that the average African thinks that we are rich or wealthy by the very fact that we're able to take an international trip. Mm -hmm. The average African, I think, is worried about trying to feed his family from day to day. And so I think that uh, one of the things that has made my work interesting mm -hmm. is that I'm able to travel for people, mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people are able to travel vicariously with me and I think that the majority of us simply can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And those that can afford it for whatever reasons, whatever sets of circumstances, have a duty to share that information verbally and with photographs. And that's what I try to do. All right. Um, this question is something that I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, uh, Kenneth Clark here in the States, you know, he talked about inferiority complexes were you know, Africans were said to, uh, were, were, were indicated by the doll test study to want to be more like white people, you know, wanted to associate with the white dolls and things like that. France Fanon talked about it as well. Ami Cecilia talked about it as well. Um, what have you observed in your travels is that impact, you know, um, of white supremacy on 
uh, uh, African people? How, have they responded similarly, or you know, or is this phenomenon you know isolated in a way that has manifested itself? I wish it was isolated, but it's not. It's what's the word systemic, mm-hmm. and I find that wherever African people are, the idea seems to be that um, white is right. Mm-hmm. In Southern Africa, I observed, this was Southern Africa, I went in 2000, and this was my first trip to Africa outside of Egypt. I came to the conclusion that the idea seemed to be that to embrace Africa is to embrace backwardness, Mm -hmm. and to embrace Europe is to embrace modernity. Mm -hmm. Our standards of beauty, Mm -hmm. our measure of success, all of those things I think we use uh, we use white standards for mm-hmm. and that's very troublesome to me our perception of the color of God mm-hmm. is perhaps the most deeply rooted um, symptom of that mm-hmm. and it's a very frightening mm-hmm. and it's getting worse instead of better mm-hmm. uh, what in your opinion are some ways to reverse you know those effects uh, study of history study of traditional African values mm-hmm. um, and not just studying them, but again, sharing that information, disseminating that information. In Uganda, I was last there, I think, two or three years ago. I, the last university that I did a presentation at was called the University of the Mountains of the Moon. Mm. And it's the only university in the whole of Uganda that has a black studies program. Mm. And I think that, again, I think we have a tendency in the United States to romanticize Africa. Mm -hmm. But I would say that psychologically, Africans on the continent are as much, if not more, in bondage than Africans in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the last question. This is a personal question. I ask uh, as many elders as I can the same question. Um, You've been in a movement uh, for reclamation of African identity, African self, African nationhood, uh, our story. For uh, for a while, for for quite a while, all my adult life, all your adult life, uh, can you see a difference since you were younger, say you know in your early twenties, tw- late teens, uh, to now? What has changed, and is it better or worse, or you know what are the differences between when you were younger to now in terms of the way the consciousness of African people? Well, you know, it's easy to be depressed. It's easy to be I guess the word immobilized. Mm -hmm. But if you look around, there are a lot of things to be, you can see we've made progress. For example, now you see a lot of people, young young people, for example, with African names. Mm -hmm. Names like Kwame and Kamau, what have you, are common now. Mm -hmm. You see people proud to wear African clothes day to day in the community. You see African hairstyles. Mm -hmm. You see people who have a desire to go to Africa whereas 30, 40 years ago, people would have a desire to go to Paris or to London. Now, I'm not saying those things don't still exist, Mm -hmm. but, you know, the growth of the Rastafarian movement. Mm -hmm. But you can see certain things that seem to indicate that we are becoming, bit by bit, more comfortable with our African selves. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to point these things out, because if you don't see these signs of progress, Mm -hmm. you can get very discouraged and even throw up your hands and say, Mm -hmm. forget it. And once you do that, you become a part of the problem. Well, thank you, Brother uh, Renoko, man, uh, 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 Baba Rashidi. You've been here dropping a serious lecture for the people. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you want to give any last words for those that are listening online or those that may be catching this or hearing about you for the first time? Yeah, my catchphrase is I repeat it again and again and again. What you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. What you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself, and what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. History is not finished, and the past is not dead. Thank you, Brother Rashidi. Thank you, brother. All right, you have a good one. Peace. Y'all stay tuned to Happily National Day for more interviews live from the movement. Peace.